This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Well, that was a quite generous introduction. I'd like to thank everyone for being here this evening. I am truly honored by this invitation to speak with you tonight. And I've tried to put together a presentation that will be of interest to this uh, general audience. What I want to do first, though, is just say that this is such a distinct honor to be here and give this special SMART seminar. When I was reading about Bill SMART and also Mary, I was um, really humbled by everything that, that they accomplished and, and the kind of contributions that they made and they continue to make through their generosity. In reading about uh, Bill, um, I thought that you know, again, um, he did so many different things across so many different areas, from starting with serving in the US Army, uh, to becoming a bench chemist, and then rising to manager at Abbott, to uh, trekking something like 40 miles each way every day, uh, to finish an MBA through night school that um, expanded over something like six years, um, and then rose ultimately to corporate vice president and president of Ross Laboratories division of, of Abbott. He contributed to, say, nutritional supplements and, and other things that, again, continue to benefit mankind uh, even today. In addition to all of that, in terms of his professional career, he um, was very active in community leadership roles, president of several organizations. And so, again, I'm, I'm humbled to be here standing in front of you um, today. I also uh, share with Bill and Mary a love of my family. I have three sons. Um, Bill and Mary had five children and then also raised a niece and nephew. And I got all this information from his obituary in case you haven't read it yet. Um, I encourage you to do so. I tried to summarize almost um, everything that was in there, but there, there's more. There's quite a bit more if you're interested in taking a look. So again, thank you for this opportunity, um, and I look forward to um, questions and discussions following the presentation. So I've divided um, this presentation into two parts. Part one is tonight. It's, it's more uh, general. And then tomorrow, if you're interested and you are a chemist, then you may want to attend that presentation as well. I'll get pretty deeply into synthetic organic chemistry, talking about regiochemical effects and, and, and things. Um, but tonight, I want to focus on the overall um, effort in my lab that's been going on for about 15 to 20 years, and that is to develop synthetic methodologies by which to transform natural products or natural building blocks into functional polymer materials. And we do so in such a way as we control how those molecules are connected together to make these polymer structures and control the molecular architecture so that they can exhibit some kind of function. Now, for many, many years, um, polymers, plastics have been of um, keen interest, uh, fundamentally and also practically, to society where often it, it, there wasn't a lot of concern about what would happen with that plastic after it had completed its, its function. What we've been interested in my lab is building in degradability into those polymers so that they can break down to regenerate those natural building blocks after they've completed their performance. And the motivation for this was based upon discussions with orthopedic surgeons that I had as an assistant professor when I was at Washington University in St. Louis, and they were describing to me the kinds of materials that they were using for bone repair, and we had basically brainstormed on, on how could we replace things like metals for bone repair with some kind of a degradable polymer that would be suitable in the mechanical properties to perform well, but also break down to non-toxic uh, degradation products that would also be bioresorbable. And that's what got us started on this journey of using natural building blocks. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that initial motivation and, and how we've selected carbohydrates or sugars as our primary building block through a lot of the work that goes on in my lab. And then I'll discuss the chemistry um, just briefly today and tell you that um, in some cases, the chemistry that we have been using is not really that safe or environmentally friendly. 
And so over the last few years, we've been working toward uh, the combination of natural building blocks together with carbon dioxide. So it basically fixes carbon dioxide, taking it out of the environment, builds it into a polymer together with these natural building blocks. Ultimately, the degradation typically involves a hydrolysis, so it does regenerate the CO2, but at least we're not contributing to the overall increase in the CO2. So I'll tell you uh, just a little bit about uh, that chemistry uh, tonight. And then I want to also highlight the sustainability aspects in terms of the applications of these materials that we make and highlight two startup companies, one called Sugar Plastics. And I do have to say I have a financial conflict of interest. I'm a co-founder and president of Sugar Plastics. And <laughs> it's not making any money, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> uh, but Sugar Plastics was created to make um, uh, objects that might accidentally be lost in the environment and not retrievable so that they could undergo degradation so they wouldn't cause uh, environmental or health hazards. Um, we've also been uh, in my laboratory working together with another startup company called Taisha Technologies. And Taisha was a company that was formed specifically to license the intellectual property that we've developed at Texas A&M University to take our plastic materials and use them in plastic packaging to address the plastic pollution problem. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that story as well. And then finally, I'll just introduce this concept that we've only started over the last few months, and that is to be concerned about where we get these natural building blocks that we're using to make these plastic materials. And we have an interest in not competing with, say, food sources or fuel sources or, or other things, um, other materials that are used for society. And so we are working with a collaborator to um, harvest building blocks from insects. And in particular, we're working with black soldier flies. So that'll be the last thing. Um, so this is kind of um, an outline of the presentation. We're going to start with this part, again, about the initial motivation and a bit about the chemistry of how we um, build up these um, polymer materials. But since this is a general audience, I want to give you my take on chemists. I, I met several people who were not chemists in the room, but they might be associated with chemists, so they probably know this already, that chemists are control freaks. Um, we like to control everything in our world. Um, we first want to understand matter, uh, and I spoke with Sally about how to image um, molecules and also atoms. So we want to be able to see atoms, we want to see molecules, we want to understand them, but then we do, that's not where we stop. We want to also manipulate them. Um, and and uh, in the case of synthetic chemists in particular, our focus is on making new matter, right? Synthesizing new kinds of things so that we can have new properties, new functions, uh, new uh, performance characteristics. In the case of polymer chemists, and I'm a polymer chemist, we work on macromolecules. So these are big molecules. Um, and often those macromolecules extend even to higher dimensionalities to the nanoscopic or microscopic uh, regimes. And always the intention is to incorporate some kind of function. So we don't want to just make something that's going to sit on the shelf, um, but we want to, at least in the case of polymer chemists, make something that we can, we can actually use in everyday life. Okay, so the, I mentioned polymer chemists and this process of taking small molecules and building up macromolecules often involves a, a process that's called polymerization. So when we have small molecules, those are monomers, so single monomers, and in a um, linking of those monomers together, that combines multiple molecules or poly number of mers, and that's why they're called polymers. And in the simplest case, those monomers would be linked through two connection points, which would give a linear polymer structure. And if all of the monomers are of the same composition, then that's a linear homopolymer. And we also can have multiple kinds of repeat units, which get to into copolymers and things. So it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. But I just wanted to give you um, one uh, particular example of a natural small molecule, glucose, again, a carbohydrate or a sugar. And um, in the case of glucose, that's a small molecule. And when it's in the solid state, then multiple small molecules are interacting with one another through physical interactions. And those interactions are intermolecular interactions between different molecules. 
And they're weaker than the typical covalent bonds that build up a polymer. So in the case of glucose, if, if it's cast out into a thin sheet, then it can be something that's called sugar glass and it's used, say, in the movie industry because it can be broken uh, quite easily and, and doesn't cause um, injury. When the glucose monomer repeat units are linked together into a polymer, uh, in, the, um, in, in one case, those glucose repeat units can be connected through just these uh, two positions Sorry, this is called the one position, and this is called the four position. So around the glucose ring, this is, this is position one, two, three, and four, and then this is five, but then there's six, okay? So when it's connected through the one and the four positions, as is shown here, then that's a linear polymer of glucose, and that's called cellulose. And it's um, the primary structural material found in nature, for instance, in wood, and you know that, that wood is, um, strong and, and, and difficult to break. So that's an example of a, a natural uh, polymer. Uh, a synthetic polymer that you may also be familiar with is Kevlar, and Kevlar is a polymer uh, that has amide linkages between the um, building blocks. So the, these, um, this case of a carbon um, bound in a double bond to an oxygen and then bound to a nitrogen, this is called an amide linkage. And the groups between those amides are aromatic rings, so this is a polyaramid, as it's called. And in the case of Kevlar, this polyaramid allows for good chain-chain alignment uh, interactions. It provides a really strong, tough material, and, and you'll find it in, uh, say, uh, anti-ballistic applications. I have a little um, video that I'm going to play. I don't have the copyright on it, so um, I hope I don't get into trouble with that. Uh, but it was shared uh, with, with me from a professor over in Israel, so I can always blame it on him. Um, and it's uh, from uh, Batman, and it's an introduction to the concept of where you might find Kevlar and also a regioisomer of Kevlar, which is uh, Nomex, and I'll show you the chemistry of these on the on the next slide. But I'm just going to let this play, and I'll I'll be quiet because it does have some some um, audio. Nomex survival suit for advanced infantry. Kevlar biweave, reinforced joints, tear resistant. This sucker will stop a knife. Bulletproof. Anything but a straight shot. Why didn't they put it into production? Being counters didn't think a soldier's life was worth 300 grand. Okay, so we are in the IHMC, where those robots, I'm sure, are a lot more than $300,000. So we know that the soldier's life is worth a lot, so that's probably not accurate. But what is accurate is that Kevlar and Nomex are really important materials that, that we will find in applications that require that kind of performance. And so I want to just show you a little bit of the chemistry of, of Kevlar and Nomex and uh, introduce you to the concept that the way that those small molecules are connected together alters their, their properties. So uh, in, this is um, going to be the general case of polyamides. Um, and as I said, um, polyaramids are, are one type of a polyamide where there are aromatic rings between those amide groups. There are also what are called aliphatic polyamides, and in the case of the polyaramids, I just had shown you the, the chemistry of Kevlar, and that's the, as shown there. Um, and I want to point out here, if I come across, the connections uh, in the, across this aromatic ring are what are called para. So they're in, in, say, the one and the four positions again. And that paraconnectivity allows for the polymer chain to be quite linear and allow for that chain-chain uh, packing to occur. In the case of Nomex, the connections between these amide linkages is through the one and the three positions on that aromatic ring, and that's called meta. And you can see already in this structure that that introduces a kink. So there, there's not this great linearity, and there's this kinkiness to, sorry, that's a weird word, but uh, this kinkiness <laughs> to the, the Nomex um, backbone structure. And so it doesn't pack together as well. It doesn't crystallize. It doesn't have the same mechanical properties, but it's still 
not very chemically reactive. It's not uh, very f uh, flammable. And so, um, uh, sorry, and I want to also point out that um, Kevlar was um, invented at, at DuPont um, by uh, Stephanie Kwolek. And um, I, I always like to introduce um, females who many, many years ago uh, had big uh, impacts in, in science and technology. Um, and and in, in, in addition to Kevlar, as I said, Nomex is something that, that may not be as uh, strong and tough, but it is uh, flame resistant and chemically resistant. And so you'll find it in things like clothing and, and other textiles that are used, say, uh, for firefighters. Um, even simple things like the of glove, and I'm not endorsing this product, but of glove, uh, and I'm sorry it's too small to read here, uh, it says in this... Um, area here, it says high heat protection, flame resistant, and it says made with Kevlar and Nomex by DuPont. And so you can see that uh, this, um, these, these polymers are, are, are really uh, important to, to um, basic everyday life. In the case of aliphatic polyamides, uh, between the amide linkages, so we still have this carbon-oxygen double bond, which is called a carbonyl, connected to the nitrogen and the amide linkage. Now there's not that aromatic ring, but these are just a, this is just a chain of carbons with hydrogens on them, and that's called an aliphatic group. And they're not as uh, flame-resistant and chemically resistant. Um, but nylon 6-6 and nylon 6 you'll also be familiar with because you find it in, again, um, woven into fibers, and, and you'll find it in things like tents and, and toothbrush uh, bristles and, and, and things. So again, important uh, materials. So let's get back to um, in my laboratory, uh, not necessarily using the building blocks of Kevlar, Nomex, or, or nylon, but rather using uh, natural uh, building blocks. Again, our intention is to control the macromolecular architecture, not just make linear polymers, but maybe make star-like structures or these bottle brush-like structures and control the compositions in different regions. That's why they're colored differently. Um, and really build up this complexity into the molecules so that they can perform function, and then also, as I said, uh, degrade after their function is complete. So the kinds of natural building blocks that we work with are, again, uh, glucose, and you've seen that structure already, and, uh, and other uh, sugars. Those can be, again, derived from things like breaking down cellulose or, or starch. Um, we also work with amino acids to build up synthetic polyamides that would be derived from amino acid building blocks. Those come from, say, proteins that can be found in, in various uh, meats and, and other natural sources. We work with nucleic acids that are derived from DNA or RNA. Um, we also work with polyphenolic compounds, and polyphenolic compounds you might find in, say, teas. Um, this particular polyphenolic compound, quercetin, is found in uh, onions or elderberries. A um, couple of other biphenolic compounds, magnolol and hinochial, are interesting building blocks that we like to work with. And those come from my favorite tree, magnolia trees. And, and we happen to see a magnolia tree walking around today, and it's already blooming, uh, surprisingly. <laughs> Um, and then we work with things like ferulic acid, quinic acid, other natural building blocks. And, and really, the selection of what building block we're working with is dependent on which student has an interest, either in where that building block comes from, what its properties are. Several students are interested in um, using building blocks that, say, would have um, pharmaceutical or cardiovascular beneficial um, properties. Others are interested in um, things that just have an interesting uh, structure or come from an interesting plant like a magnolia. So as um, was stated during the introduction, I'm happy to um, have students visit my laboratory, engage in, in research projects. Um, my interest is always for you to come to graduate school at Texas A&M <laughs> University, of course. So I will be completely honest about that as well. But we're going to focus today just on uh, glucose as a building block. And again, I wanted to introduce the motivation behind why we chose glucose. And this was the first natural building block that we began working with in my laboratory. And again, it was um, based upon discussions with the orthopedic surgeons who were talking about the metal materials that they were working with. And they, there are several issues with working with metals. I've just highlighted two of them here. 
The first is that they typically have a modulus that is an order of magnitude greater than that of bone, so they're stiffer and, and they, they don't uh, allow for um, good uh, interactions between the, the metal and, and the bone. And also they don't undergo degradation, so they have to be surgically removed um, afterward. Anybody have like metal screw, uh, sorry, I shouldn't ask you personal things, but yeah, <laughs> metal screws or, or rods or things implanted. Um, Okay, so uh, replacement of metals with degradable polymers is not anything new. There's been a lot of work in this area. Um, typically, these degradable polymers are things like polylactic acid or polyglycolic acid. They're polyesters. When they undergo hydrolysis, they uh, produce hydroxy acids. So lactic acid is what gives you sore muscles after exercise. So you know that if you have something like um, a suture or a screw implanted and it's going to undergo hydrolysis and, and generate lactic acid or glycolic acid, it can be unpleasant uh, to deal with. And in fact, in the large quantities of, of larger objects like screws, it can cause uh, wounds to, to open. Um, in addition to that, even while they're intact, they have an order, a, a, a modulus that's an order of magnitude lower than that of bone, so they al also have this mechanical properties um, mismatch, and they have limited uh, functionality. So when we were, again, planning for what we might uh, work on, we said, well, let's look to nature and see what nature uses as a structural material um, in, in, in the plant world. Um, Aside from bone, in the plant world, the typical material is, is cellulose. And so we thought that should be a model material. Uh, when we look at the chemical structure of, of cellulose, um, its good mechanical properties come from the chemical uh, structure. Like Kevlar, um, the presentation of the uh, connections through the one and the four positions means that there is this linear structure that allows for the polymer chains to pack next to each other. There's also reinforcement through hydrogen bonding between those uh, chains that leads to uh, those, uh, again, mechanical properties. Um, that gives a, a modulus that's at least on the same order of magnitude to that of bone. So you'd think, well, let's just use cellulose, let's just use wood. Um, but the problem is that humans don't possess the cellulase enzymes that are required to break down those glycosidic linkages that are between the, the uh, glucose repeat units along the cellulose backbone. So many years ago, back in the mid-1990s, we actually said, well, let's just take that structure of cellulose and replace the glycosidic linkages, that's, that's these here, with something that could be hydrolyzed without requiring the cellulase enzymes. So we thought if we install that carbon-oxygen double bond, that carbonyl, that would make a polycarbonate of glucose. And the polycarbonate, for those chemists in the room, would be a carbonate constructed through a hemiacetal position. So it would be hydrolytically labile. And upon hydrolysis, it would produce glucose and carbon dioxide, both of which could be bioresorbable. Okay, so we thought that the linearity of this structure would allow for good mechanical properties, and hydro, again, hydrolytic degradation would produce um, those bioresorbable degradation products. That target structure is something we've been working on since the mid-1990s, and I can tell you we haven't realized it yet. Um, so if we take glucose, this is a small molecule, um, but it has a lot of functionality. So all of those OH groups that you see, those are called hydroxyl groups. Those are all reactive, and so if we want to build a linear polymer out of this, we have to use two of those positions, and we have to block the three other ones. So there are five hydroxyls, and we only want to use two of them. And so we thought, well, there's two different strategies we could go about doing this. We could use what's called condensation step growth polymerization, or we could use addition chain growth polymerization. So Alex Loniker was my first PhD student at Texas A&M University. He joined my lab in 2009 when I moved there from Washington University. And Alex set about a strategy to block three of those hydroxyl groups with protecting groups and keep the hydroxyl groups in the one and four positions open so then he could use a carbonylation agent, for instance, phosgene, uh, as a co-monomer and install those carbonyls building up that polycarbonate backbone, and then he would do a deprotection to isolate the desired polymer. 
I'll show you um, the progress that he made in just a moment. But the other strategy was pursued by Kuichiro Mikami, who was a postdoc in my group. And he said, well, I want to block three of the positions. And he chose to block the, the one, two, and three positions, whereas Alex was seeking to block the two, three, and six positions. And then he wanted to use the four and six positions to cyclize into the acyclic carbonate that then he could subject to a ring opening polymerization to um, produce the polycarbonate. Okay, so in Al I'll show you just one slide of the chemistry for each of them. Um, so in Alex's case, again, he was going to go, he was going to start here with glucose and do regioselective protection to block the two, three, and six positions, leave open the hydroxyl groups in the one and four, do a polycondensation reaction to establish the polycarbonate backbone, and then do deprotection. He thought that at this point when it was protected, it might be a polycarbonate that could be like bisphenol A polycarbonate, an important engineering plastic that is experiencing challenges because of the issues with bisphenol A. And then upon deprotection, he would have a high, more hydrophilic polymer backbone that would undergo hydrolysis, uh, again, to regenerate the glucose and produce the carbon dioxide. So he did manage to synthesize this um, monomer that is a 1,4-diol. He also then um, studied an, a, a regioisomer of that, which is a 1,6-diol. The hydroxyl groups are in the 1 and 6 positions. And then also two other monomers uh, were having the hydroxyl groups in the 2 and 6 or the 3 and 6 positions. Now, as I mentioned, this site right here, this, this um, functionality when the ring is closed up, this is called a hemiacetal, and polymers from these two monomers were less stable than polymers from these two monomers, as one would anticipate. So Alex went through a series of studies of these polymers. We published that several years ago, um, and he never did manage to get those protecting groups off. It's, it's quite challenging to do so. Um, but let me show you also what Kuichiro um, uh, followed up with. Um, again, he p um, protected the one, two, and three positions with methyl protecting groups. Now this is still a glucose ring, but I've, it's been drawn flat instead of in the chair uh, conformation. And he put the cyclic carbonate through the four and six positions. He then borrowed some chemistry that's been developed by others uh, in, in the chemistry community to use organobase catalyst to facilitate the ring opening polymerization. And Cuitero confirmed that that was a controlled polymerization and we could produce polymers of, of um, pre, predetermined degrees of polymerization, so chain lengths, with narrow dispersity over those uh, chain lengths. And again, we published that work now about 10 years ago. Um, I want to show you a project that we're just getting off the ground in the last few months, and that relies upon the degradation of these polymers by hydrolysis. So this is a slightly different polymer than the one that um, Kuichiro had made. It was also produced by ring opening polymerization, where the polycarbonate now is through the two and three positions instead of through the four and six. But what's interesting about this polymer is it has this polycarbonate backbone it also has the four and six positions protected by what's called a benzylidine acetal. And this benzylidine acetal is labile under acidic conditions. The polycarbonate backbone is labile under basic conditions. So what Simca did was she produced this polymer and then she made pellets of it and studied its hydrolytic degradation, so cleavage under um, uh, action by water, uh, at neutral pH versus acidic or basic conditions. So the neutral conditions are the red data. What you see is that the mass remaining as a function of time remains at about 100%. So the, the pellet is, is not breaking down at all, which means the molecular structures are not breaking down. Everything remains intact. But under acidic conditions, what you can see in the black uh, data that are plotted here is that it takes several weeks before there's this rapid decline in the mass of the pellet. And we thought that was a, a bit of an unusual profile for the hydrolytic degradation of the materials. Under basic conditions, it was just this progressive decline in mass as a function of time, as though things were degrading in a more uniform manner. 
And what Simca did was she conducted a series of nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy studies to figure out what was happening molecularly to the, these materials under these various conditions. And what she confirmed was that under acidic conditions, the acetal, the benzylidine acetal side chains were being cleaved. That was then um, revealing the hydroxyl groups that then transformed what was initially a water insoluble hydrophobic polymer into a hydrophilic water soluble polymer. And so after cutting enough of those side chains off, then the polymer would begin dissolving. And so that's why she didn't see much uh, loss of mass initially, but then it progressed rapidly. Um, in contrast, under basic conditions, she confirmed that it was cleavage of the carbonate backbone uh, groups with the benzylidine acetal um, side chain functionalities remaining intact. So it was just a progressive breaking down of the, of the polymer backbone. Okay, the reason that I'm, I'm telling you about this is because this uh, introduces a unique opportunity to study something that's, that's completely new in, in polymer um, supramolecular assembly. During the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned the, the chemistry's, chemists as control freaks that polymer chemists often expand into nanoscopic uh, materials, and that's something that my group has been interested in for a very long time. And so we thought that if we make a polymer that can undergo multimolecular assembly into a nanostructure, and then we trigger some kind of change in it, then that, that would lead to morphological transitions. And that's, that's unique. So let me tell you what's been done in, in the supermolecular assembly of polymers over the last couple of decades. And that is that small molecule monomers are built into polymers where the composition of that polymer is varied to program it for supermolecular assembly, much like proteins have a sequence that allows them to fold in a particular way. In the synthetic polymer uh, materials, often it's some kind of a blocky polymer structure where there might be one segment that, say, is hydrophobic and water insoluble connected to another segment that is water soluble and hydrophilic. So hydrophobic, hydrophilic, those are called amphiphilic materials. When those are put into water, they can form various kinds of morphologies. So they could be spheres, uh, uh, cylinders, those are pretty common. Um, more rare are the toroidal structures that look kind of like uh, SpaghettiOs in that image, um, and, and also disk-like uh, structures. And these are some of the electron uh, micrograph uh, images, not at the high resolution where we're seeing individual molecules. Rather, we're seeing nanoscopic assemblies of multiple polymer uh, molecules. We've also done um, studies where we cross-link together polymer chains within some um, uh, region of those nanoscopic assemblies, and, and those are what my lab calls shell crosslink kinetolite nanostructures or just shell crosslink nanostructures. They could al alternatively be core crosslinked. And we've assembled those into higher order uh, materials as well. Now, from each of these kinds of um, morphologies, whether they're just supramolecular assemblies, those can be degraded and that causes destruction. Um, or we could degrade just part of a cross-linked material, and that leads to, say, something like a nano-cage-like uh, morphology. So all of that's been known for a long time. What was surprising over about the last decade is that uh, if this process is done in situ, in, in real time, where there's growth of a polymer chain that causes the supramolecular assembly, as the polymerization is occurring, then these really unusual morphologies, for instance, this odd shape that's shown in the, in the lower uh, left, can then be um, observed. And so that process is called polymerization-induced self-assembly, or PISA. So again, that's known. What I'm now proposing and what my, my group has just gotten started is what's called degradation-induced disassembly. So where we would assemble a structure and then begin cutting apart bits of it and see what kind of transformation uh, occurs in that uh, supramolecular assembly. We think this is going to lead to unique uh, structures and unique properties. Okay, so I think I'm going a little bit behind schedule. Um, so let me, uh, let me try to catch up just, just a little bit. I'll go over this chemistry bit um, rather quickly and I'll get to the movie. Um, but as I said, in this polymer that's um, shown in this region here, 
it can be cut in, in two distinct ways. We can cut off the side chains or we can cut the backbone. And we thought if we make a, a polymer from that that is designed for assembly into, into a particular morphology, let's say morphology one, uh, and then we cut off the side chains, then that might undergo some kind of transformation into a new morphology. And alternatively, if we cut the backbone, we might cut those um, units that are assembling together into smaller pieces, and that also might cause some transformation into new, new morphology. So let me jump through the chemistry uh, here. Under acidic conditions, we saw that under, after weeks in Simca's case, there wasn't much happening. We also don't see much happening under acidic conditions in these uh, kinds of morphological transitions. But under basic conditions, we see that within minutes something happens. So the data on the bottom, if we just focus on, on this plot right here, this is what's called a dynamic light scattering uh, trace, where we're, we're looking at um, scattering of light, and you can see that happening here with a laser pointer um, shining through a solution of these assembled nanoparticles. And that scattering that we can see with our naked eye can be quantified, and that tells us the size of the particles that are scattering the light. And after just a matter of minutes, you can see the particles become larger in size. After a few more minutes, now we get some smaller uh, particles and, and, and still some larger than they were originally. And then after just a matter of hours, everything becomes a little bit crazy. And in fact, you can see that there's less scattering of light here after everything basically um, broke down, but it's not only because um, the particles fell apart, but rather they, there's some kind of reassembly that happened. And you can see here in this image, it's a little bit small, but I'll show you a video in just a moment, that, that the original um, individual nanoparticle assemblies broke apart and something else formed. Okay, and I'll show you the video here. And it's gonna go, this is uh, accelerated, this is minutes that you're looking at. So there's one hour. And look at that, it's just like crazy what happens, right? After an hour and a half, and it's, it's, it's um, changing in the chemical composition, but also in the morphological uh, structure, and things are reassembling into some new kind of uh, structure. So Cassidy is the student who's been doing this. She's a second year PhD student. She just sent me this video last week, and I told her that I, I, the first time I presented it was on Monday at Georgia Tech, and and uh, people were pretty impressed. I don't know if you're impressed, but I, I really <laughs> love the, the, love the video. So the message here is that um, in, in relation to Zig Ziglar, uh, and I don't know if you know he, he, uh, who Zig Ziglar is, or yeah, motivational speaker, et cetera. Um, one of the quotes that I found on the internet is that he, he would say, success is not a destination, it's a journey, and I think that that's a message that I, I consider you know, every day. Um, and uh, in, in this analogy, we would say degradation is not total destruction, but it's an opportunity for some kind of transformative reconstruction uh, process. So that's, that's something we're working on. And like I said, those, um, the video is just from last week, and, and we're not even close to, to understanding the system or, or publishing the, the work. Okay, so in addition to um, the upper left where um, that was Alex's work and, and the middle uh, upper part, which was uh, Quichero's, and then some of uh, Simca's work down here at the lower right, we've made a lot of other polymers from glucose, okay? And um, we've studied all kinds of uh, things about the chemistry, which I'll, I'll tell you about tomorrow if, if you come to the lecture. But the key challenge he, here is that I, I didn't explain to you that all of those chemistries are using phosgene or a phosgene analog in, in some way. And of course, it's a safe reagent to use as long as you're trained and, and working under um, safe conditions, but it's, it's non-ideal. And so I'll just summarize real quickly our efforts to use carbon dioxide. And this work was done by David Tran. He graduated just recently and began a position at HP up in Corvallis, Oregon. And he was working as a student jointly between my laboratory and Don Derensberg's. And Don has worked on several catalysts that allow for the trans transformation of cyclic ethers. Um, for instance, this structure here is a four-membered cyclic ether. This is called an oxetane that allow for transformation of cyclic ethers with carbon dioxide to produce uh, polycarbonates. So David uh, used some of Don's catalysts to uh, do this copolymerization and, and produce uh, 
through this ring opening copolymerization process, these polycarbonates, but he found that always he, there was some contamination of the, by the cyclic carbonate structure. And remember, Kuichiro was wanting to make the cyclic carbonate. David was not wanting to make the cyclic carbonate. But what he did was he changed the catalyst and he optimized for the cyclic carbonate. So in my lab, we often, when we uh, have a failure, we try to turn it into something that's interesting. And David was able to do that. He was able to produce the cycloaddition product and then subject it to a controlled ring opening polymerization and access the polycarbonate structures. I think given the time, I'm gonna jump through the chemistry of this and, and I'm happy to explain it um, to anyone who's interested. But I wanna get into the next part of the, the presentation, which is the commercial translation. And we'll talk about um, sugar plastics and also uh, Tasha. And this is kind of a, um, a complicated story, so um, let me uh, break it down. Um, but the motivation for forming both of these companies um, are similar but distinctly uh, unique. Um, and, and many of you have seen things um, in, in the news about plastics pollution. And uh, there are often these, these images that you'll see that suggest that it's kind of a cute issue, but it's, it's really quite not. Um, and it's not only a problem for wildlife, but also for humans. And what a lot of people focus on is the plastics that one can see and the plastics that are problematic. But those could be, say, collected, cleaned, sorted, and, and recycled. Um, the problem to me is more the plastics that are ingested, whether they're macroscopic plastics or you may have heard about microplastics uh, as well. And the um, issue uh, that I feel is that we need to be thinking about plastics not necessarily only for recycling purposes, but also for what I'm highlighting here is digestibility, right? So that if they are ingested, they can be digested. And they have to do so on an appropriate time frame. Um, and and that's, that's a complication, and that's a complication with any uh, plastic material. So there, there has to be stability for the application and then an ability to either degrade naturally or under environmental conditions or be actively recycled. Okay, so the polymers that are in our automobiles, we of course want to last for a very long time. My car is now, it's a 2014, I've had it for, uh, gosh, almost nine years. Um, I don't want it breaking down anytime soon. It's a pretty expensive car. Um, but the, And also the, the plastics that we find in, say, sports equipment, we also don't want breaking down. That's my son when he was an offensive lineman uh, in, in Texas football, <laughs> if you know how challenging Texas football is in terms of the weather and the sun and everything. You just want those to be really robust materials. But the gallon of milk that you purchase is only going to last for, say, maybe seven days, but that high-density polyethylene that it's packaged in will last for hundreds of years. And so I think we need to think about uh, this mismatch that often occurs and better match uh, the stability to the, to the application. We also have to think about what happens to materials when they're under their intended conditions versus some extreme environment they might experience. So the typical case is bisphenol A polycarbonate. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, it's a fantastic plastic material. It's in our eyeglasses and lots of other applications and some of the football equipment. Um, but when it was used in, say, baby bottles or drinking cups and put into a dishwasher, then the high temperatures and detergents and things that it would experience cause some hydrolysis and release bisphenol A. So even if bisphenol A is not present as a residual monomer upon production, it can be produced upon degradation of the material. So we have to think about that. I also don't trust humans to actually um, uh, recycle actively. I actually threw one of my uh, water bottles in the trash back there. I'm hoping that someone at the local um, waste management company, um, you know, sorts things. I, I don't know, but but uh, you know, we all we all end up doing that. And so there's only about nine percent of the plastics that could be recycled are actually recycled. And the problem is not only whether people put it in the right place, but after it's put in the right place, you can see this this 
image down here of the sorting problem because different plastics have to be recycled by different processes and, and, and separately from one another. There's a lot of work going on in recycling. It's very promising, but again, I, I just don't, I, I think that there are opportunities for new kinds of plastics where maybe it's not going to be recoverable. Okay, so in, in my lab, what we've focused on is, again, using natural products. Um, that allows for sustainability in their sourcing, but also more um, for this uh, ability to break back down. Okay, and that gets us to um, one of the startup companies, um, Sugar Plastics. Uh, we had all this progress made on taking glucose and making polycarbonates, and we thought, well, let's start a company. But before we did that, uh, we joined what's called the Innovation Core program run by the National Science Foundation. And uh, I was the principal investigator on the project, working with two entrepreneurial leads, Ashley and Simka. Ashley was a postdoc at the time, Simka was a PhD student, and we had an industrial mentor, uh, Bill Howell, who spent many years at Dow and, and has a great industrial background. Okay, so we entered in this program way back in the summer of 2016. Um, to, to become part of the program, you have to submit a proposal. We titled our, program, our proposal Sugar Hooks and Worms. The program officers at the NSF um, had a teleconference with us before we were selected to join that program. They said, we hate that title, you can't use it, you have to change it. So I don't remember what we came up with, something boring after that. I still like the idea of sugar hooks and worms. Um, but beyond that, once we joined the program, they really expanded our way of thinking about, you know, what do we want to do with our, with our technology? So one of the aspects is to build out a business model canvas, and that's a living um, uh, canvas, uh, considering all kinds of aspects of, of commercialization. We had to conduct at least 100 customer discovery interviews. We did 101. <laughs> Talk about doing the minimal. Um, but uh, it took a lot of effort. Um, and, and we did that across a, a broad um, region. Um, we went out on, on boats and things because actually what we were considering for our technology was, again, these sugar hooks and worms. And, and one of the things that the NSF program officers and the um, teaching team at the in a, NSF i -Corps program hated about that was that the idea came from my husband. So he is an uh, avid angler, and, and he often would cast into our, what they call in Texas, a tank, which is a man-made pond, um, and lose his, um, lose his uh, soft plastic fishing lures. And he said to me, you know, you're working on these biomedical materials, um, you know, these degradable polymers for orthopedic applications. Uh, can't you just make me some worms that I can cast out and not worry about losing them? And, and they, they thought that was kind of foolish. So they pushed us into considering things like dog toys, dog chew, chew toys. And, and if anyone's had an animal that has ingested those and had to have surgery, you know, that, that's um, problematic. But making a plastic that's tough enough that a dog, especially I've got a lab in a German shepherd that they won't chew it up is really, really challenging. So we're still thinking about the um, soft plastic fishing lures, but as of the summer of 2016, we were a no-go on starting a company. Okay, that turns me to this complication. So the intellectual property for anything that anyone does at a university is owned by the university. So Texas A&M University owned the intellectual property, and they licensed that intellectual property to a startup company called Tasha Technologies. Um, that was okay because I was involved in those discussions and, and things, and, and Tasha was formed specifically for the purpose of licensing that technology and uh, developing it. And I, again, have a financial conflict of interest. I serve as chief technology officer for that company. Um, and because the technology wasn't ready for plastic packaging uh, in, in the way that Tasha wanted to use it, they've been sponsoring research in my laboratory for the last uh, few years to get to that point. Um, along the way, um, Ashley and I uh, also co-founded Sugar Plastics um, roughly at about the, the same time. Um, we've made some progress, and I'll show you some of that, but it's really been on the back burner um, because we've been focusing on making Tasha successful. But this is a video of some of the action of these. Um, that one got its legs cut off somehow. But, but you can see they're, they're pretty flat. Anyone fish? Yeah, yeah. So you can see the glitter. And we were told by, when we were doing our customer discovery interviews, you can see the hook under the bottom, um, that uh, 
we have to make them attractive, uh, not to the fish, but to the fisher person, fisherman, right? So that they'll buy them in the shop. Um, so it's all kinds of fun working on those. All of that work has to happen in my outdoor kitchen at home because I, I, we can't do um, work at A&M that would be in conflict. Um, but ultimately, if Tasha is successful, then we can um, sub-license from Tasha to Sugar Plastics to continue uh, that development. There's an uh, agreement in place for that. Okay, so let me tell you a, a little bit more about um, Taisha. Uh, Matthew Stone is the person who actually was heavily interested in bioplastics and um, has been the person really leading the, the um, founding and, and development of Taisha together with Clive Rankin. And Duncan Clark supports all of the operations side of it. Steve Taylor is fantastic from this science side. And he and Ashley and I, and, and mainly Steve and Ashley, work really closely on developing the technology from the scientific uh, and performance perspective. And what I can tell you is that the chemistry that I showed you earlier um, is really um, too expensive to scale up. It's also n not entirely uh, safe uh, to scale up or green to scale up for uh, addressing the global plastics um, pollution crisis. So uh, under that sponsored research agreement, what we've been working on is developing uh, better approaches to transform biomass into natural building blocks. I'm sorry, I can't show you the chemistry uh, here. Uh, and then build them those building blocks back up into what's called Agipol, uh, that's uh, Tasha's uh, terminology, so that, again, if the materials are lost or discarded, they'll break uh, back down. Um, we, in doing this, we have to be um, aware of, of, of the kinds of manufacturing that these might have to plug into. So we're working on, say, thermoplastic materials that can um, be blow molded or injection molded. We're also doing some work on thermoset materials, um, so there are different chemistries involved there. These are just um, some examples of some of the materials that we can make. I love the video of that super elastomeric material. We don't know quite what to do with it. If you have any ideas of products where it might need something like that, I'd love to hear about it. The, these, the, the upper left is a rigid, transparent plastic material that is also semi-flexible. We just change the formulation slightly and we can go from that semi-rigid um, flexible material to this elastomeric material. So it's, there's this broad spectrum of potential uh, applications. We can also formulate it in the powder form, uh, say, to be used as additives. So with so many possibilities, we need to figure out <laughs> what we're going to do. And we've um, partnered with Carl McAfee of McAfee Consulting, um, and he is... Um, spanning the scope of the, the characterization of the mechanical properties, um, uh, formulating uh, the materials, and identifying uh, potential commercial partners. Okay, so I just have a couple more slides here. I just want to show you the insect uh, concept. Um, so again, I, I, I already showed you how we take these natural building blocks, build polymers that they'll degrade. I said, look how exciting it is. We have all these potential building blocks, and they come from all these various sources. But as I said on the first slide, we have to be careful about where we're sourcing our feedstocks. And we don't want to be competing with food, fuel, and transportation, construction, you know, other important societal needs. And that's where Jeff Tomberlin comes into play. He's in the Department of Entomology, and he runs an entire program that, that grows black soldier flies. And black soldier flies are important as a food source, uh, particularly in agriculture for things like fish hatcheries and, and pig farms. And the issue is that um, there's um, a lot of adult uh, flies that and their carcasses that, that accumulate as waste. And so this is a, a perfect opportunity for us to harvest um, feedstocks from this waste insect uh, product. So we can isolate polysaccharides and, and use them as, as polysaccharides or break them down as the carbohydrate building blocks. We can isolate proteins and, and, and um, uh, collect amino acids from them, DNA and RNA to get to the nucleic acids. There are also lots of um, lipids and fatty acids that we can use um, uh, in, in our polymer uh, structures and, and various other natural products as well. So I'm pretty excited about where this is going. Again, Cassidy is leading this project. So I do need more students to join in. Uh, uh, you know, Hong Ming is working on sort of the, the polysaccharide side of it, and, and Cassidy is working on 
all the aspects of isolation and purification and, and how to move forward with the materials. Okay, so um, I just want to end with this, this last slide and, and just say that, um, you know, this issue of sustainability is something that's critical. And, and I kind of hate watching the news nowadays because it seems like we're, it's doomsday, right? And, 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 and especially in, in, in Texas, I don't know how you, you experience the weather here, but it seems like we're constantly under drought or, or flooding. And um, so the issue is, uh, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to, you know, save the, the world? How are we going to um, deal with the climate? But there's also, um, and, and here again in IHMC, uh, all these extreme environments that we have to be thinking about. And so, so what, what can we do and, and, and how can we have an impact? And so I just leave you with that. And uh, again, acknowledge uh, my research team that's worked on this, the collaborations with Don Derensberg and Jeff Tomberlin, the important um, contributions of, of Tasha and, and people there, uh, and support from the Welch Foundation and the National Science Foundation. And thank you so much for your attention and thanks for the opportunity. Any questions? There are microphones to be coming around. Yeah, over here. I just have some advice for you on the fishing lure. Yeah. Those soft plastics are very popular with bass fishermen. And I do agree that it has to be somewhat attractive. But if you just show one guy catching a big bass with that lure, <laughs> you're in. There's your money for your project. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And I think it has to be one of those pro bass, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, as soon as Tasha is successful, we can get back to the sugar plastics, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, here? Yeah, uh, oh, wait for the microphone, please, because they're recording everything, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, how do you actually uh, harvest the, uh, like the monomers to form the polymers like that? Yeah, so um, from the biomass, uh, it's a chemical breakdown process that's um, rather um, mild conditions, slightly acidic aqueous conditions. From the uh, insects, uh, there's a little bit more to it. So there's um, first an, an aqueous acid treatment, then there's an aqueous base treatment, so demineralization, uh, breaking down the protein, because what we're isolating at the moment from the insects is the chitin, so the, the polysaccharide material. It's the most abundant material in the insects. Um, ultimately, we'll want to explore isolating other um, feedstocks from the insects, but again, we just started that project a few months ago. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, so uh, my question is like biocompatibility of making a bone out of a plastic or whatnot. A lot of our plastics don't have perfect properties, so in order to change materials properties, we have to add additives or different things. So what is to prevent while we make a biosustainable or biocompatible plastic for a bone, not having to add some sort of additive to slow down degradation? Because the last thing I would want if I have to have a bone replaced is to have to have surgery every two years to slow that down, but have those additives not be the toxic thing while the, the bone or the plastic is actually biocompatible, the things we have to add to it to get the, you know, desired materials properties would not be. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. And so we are aware of that. And we pay attention to that. So the kinds of additives we're using are natural things, like let's say calcium carbonate and, and those kinds of things that would not be problematic um, as, as additives. We, I, I have to say we've kind of abandoned the, the bone repair application mainly because we were seeing these enormous challenges with like FDA approval. And just like you said, you know, if we've got this polymer and then it's got to perform with certain mechanical properties, certain de degradation properties, additives are going to change all of that and, and it just gets really complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Right here behind you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, you mentioned degradation during digestion for animals that may ingest plastics. Does the digestive chemistry change a lot from like animal to animal, let's say between birds and whales or? Yeah, that's a really great question as well. And yes, it does. And I'm so impressed. I, I, 
I, I hate to say this, but Cassidy is also leading that digestibility project. Um, and uh, she, she has dug into what is the digestive tract of these black soldier flies. And there are like three different stages. And so she's um, formulating compositions of solutions to incubate these samples under each of those conditions, and she's going to do this stage-wise. She's working with two other people in my group, so it's, it's not just her. But um, to, to go through that progression, because digestibility is much more complicated than just some hydrolytic degradation under one set of conditions, absolutely. So that's a, a great point. All right, let's thank our speaker. Thank you so much. <laughs>